Thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, thank you, and uh, to Jeremy Collins and uh, Nick Mueller here at the museum for uh, being agreeable to put on this program. Uh, this program is a joint production, if you want to call it such, between the museum and uh, Center Austria at the University of New Orleans. And uh, I'd just like to remind you that this museum would not be here in this city were it not for you and our faculty, such as Stephen Ambrose. Uh, and Nick Mueller, and of course, there is an ongoing cooperation still with the museum as my colleague, Dr. Alan Millet, is here, and uh, both I surf on uh, some of the museum's boards, uh, sort of uh, showing that that uh, relationship still is going strongly, and uh, sometimes it's forgotten, so that's when I have the opportunity I like to remind people of, of the strong relationship between the university and the museum. Uh, I should also mention that uh, this is possible due to funding of our two Austrian visitors uh, through the Botstieber Foundation of Philadelphia, who got the grant to carry on their research. Uh, and let me then take the opportunity uh, to uh, introduce all four speakers uh, in tandem here, uh, so as to give them a maximum amount of time to make their presentations. Uh, you're in for a great treat tonight. We have a wonderful panel here on a topic that is quite gruesome, actually, the lynching of Allied airmen during World War II. Uh, but I think it reflects the fact that World War II scholarship is changing. We are no longer looking at many of the events of the war in a black and white fashion, but we are often uh, looking for nuance. And I think you're going to hear a lot about uh, new World War scholarship and that nuance tonight. Uh, so the speakers in order are Dr. James Weingartner, and then our two Austrian visitors, and then uh, Tyler Bridges as the final speaker. I've asked them to talk for 20 minutes each, and hopefully we'll have some time for questions. And of course, at the end of the program, they'll be available for more questions, and Dr. Weinberg, uh, Wein, uh, uh, Gartner actually will sign his book outside. Uh, so Dr. Jim Weingartner has written four books. Uh, he is a retired professor from the University of Southern Illinois uh, with a PhD from uh, the University of Wisconsin. Uh, uh, probably amongst his best known books are his book on the Malmedy Massacre, uh, a very important book, uh, and uh, a recent uh, book about which he will actually uh, uh, talk uh, uh, today with the title Americans, Germans, and War Crimes Justice, Law, Memory, and the Good War. Uh, and the uniqueness about his research on this topic is that he actually heavily relies on judicial records, and I hope he will talk a bit about that. Our two Austrian visitors, um, Georg Hoffmann and Nicole Melanie uh, Gold, just arrived uh, a couple days ago. Uh, they uh, got a grant from the Botstieber Foundation to carry on their research about uh, the lynching of Allied airmen in the area of Austria and Hungary. Uh, and they gave this talk uh, this past summer in the UNO Summer School in Innsbruck, and uh, I said when they uh, came to the city, they definitely would have to give it here at the museum, too. It's amazing research they've been doing, amassing a massive uh, database about uh, every uh, Allied airman that was shot down over Austria and Hungary uh, during World War II. <clears throat> Uh, they have done quite a bit of uh, research on other topics uh, in World War II studies, concentration camps, for example, in the native area of Graz, Austria, and they're both just in the process of finishing uh, their PhDs at the University of Graz in Austria. Georg Hoffmann on the topic of, uh, that he's going to be talking about today, uh, Nicole uh, about uh, a World War I topic, namely the heroization uh, of uh, uh, Austrian airmen during World War I. Then finally, we're going to get a case study uh, by uh, Tyler Bridges, uh, who is quite well known in the city. Tyler Bridges, uh, for quite a few years, I think seven years, uh, was a journalist for the Times Picayune, wrote a couple of very notable books during that time, too, one on uh, David Duke, uh, the other one uh, on uh, uh, our former governor. Uh, with the title, The Rise of Gambling in Louisiana and the Fall of Governor Edward Edwards. Uh, he then moved away to uh, Miami to work for the Miami paper and was a roving correspondent in Latin Amer in America for quite a few years. Last year, he spent uh, a year at uh, Harvard University as a Neiman Fellow 
and now returned uh, to the city of New Orleans to write for an online publication, The Lens, uh, and uh, doing quite a bit of critical reporting lately. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'd like uh, Dr. Weingartner to start, please. Thank you, Gunter. I, I think I can say with confidence that I'm the only person on this panel who was actually alive uh, when the events that we're going to be discussing uh, this, this evening took place. Now, I, I don't claim that that uh, uh, gives me any special insight uh, into those events, although I do have uh, an early childhood memory that is in some degree relevant. Uh, my family lived in a, a city in the northeastern United States, actually Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, uh, which uh, had important war industry, of course, the Bethlehem Steel uh, Company. Uh, and it seemed plausible at the time that uh, the Germans might send some bombers across the Atlantic uh, to bomb us and that they would probably come at night. Uh, as a consequence, we had blackouts. Uh, the air raid sirens would sound. Uh, everyone was supposed to turn off lights and pull down shades. And uh, a neighborhood air raid warden would come around and knock on the window and yell if a stray ray of light um, was escaping from your house. And it was all kind of scary to a little kid. At least it was to this little kid. I was about three or four years old. Uh, it was only much later in my life that I realized that there were other little kids in other parts of the world uh, who had a much better reason for terror uh, when the air raid siren sounded than I had had. So that's part of the context uh, of the events that we're going to be discussing tonight. Uh, that it did take place in a war in which little kids, among others, were victims. Uh, and these events, of course, also took place within a country ruled by a brutal regime that felt free to practice murder uh, on a colossal scale. And of course, the air offensive carried out by the British uh, and by the United States against Germany was part of an effort uh, to destroy that regime as efficiently as possible. Uh, and certainly, the destruction of that regime was a moral necessity. But the air offensive itself was also brutal and costly in human lives, although significantly less so than the target. It killed an estimated half million German civilians, in addition to laying waste a hundred or more German cities and many smaller communities. The Allies repaid Germans for their bombings of Warsaw, Rotterdam, London, Coventry, and Belgrade many times over. And that air offensive was also costly in terms of Allied flyers' lives. Approximately 85,000 airmen uh, from the uh, British Empire uh, and the United States died, most of them from enemy fighter attack, flak, or accidents. But some, approximately 350 is a recent estimate, uh, were murdered after parachuting from damaged aircraft or crash landing. The murders of downed Allied airmen roughly paralleled the intensification of the Allied bomber campaign, with the RAF uh, Bomber Command, as I'm sure most of you know, all of you know probably, uh, practicing uh, what was known as area bombardment, uh, in which uh, the aiming point was simply the most densely uh, populated part of a city with a heavy concentration of incendiary bombs. The United States, of course, had started the war uh, with a policy of high altitude precision bombardment by day, whereas the British, of course, bombed by night, uh, based on the Norden bomb site, which supposedly conferred, conferred pickle barrel accuracy uh, on uh, American bombs. Um, and again, theoretically, uh, that would permit uh, the uh, surgical precision uh, strikes uh, against uh, industrial targets and military industrial targets. But of course, practice under combat conditions were very, it was a very different story. <clears throat> uh, it's reported that average bombing accuracy uh, was on the order of three quarters of a mile. 
Sergeant John J. Briel, uh, who was a ball turret gunner, <clears throat> excuse me, in a B-17 of the 457th Bomb Group, confided to his diary the results of an attack on the marshalling yards in the town of Mayan and wrote, we blasted the yards all right and the entire city with it. I saw the whole city disappearing and I suddenly realized again what a rotten business this was. Beginning in November 1943, moreover, U.S. bombers often resorted to blind bombing under conditions of poor visibility using, using H2X, uh, a primitive onboard radar that was codenamed Mickey Mouse, developed from the British H2S system that was capable of locating cities but not precision targets. And this, to quote American historian of the air war, Richard G. Davis, produced, a calamitous, res produced calamitous results. Uh, for the German civilian population. <clears throat> the earliest murders of Allied flyers seems to have occurred in the aftermath of the bombing of Hamburg uh, in late July 1943, which was primarily, of course, the work of the RAF, uh, that produced a catac cataclysmic firestorm in which 46,000 people died. More deaths than in the whole of the German Blitz against Britain in 1940 and 41. Hamburg policeman uh, Otto Müller recalled having encountered a young girl who was dragging behind her the dead body of her younger brother and who begged him for help. He remembered that the incident had made him so angry uh, that he would have shot any enemy airman that he might have encountered. And that was a foreshadowing of things to come. And Germans were assailed not only by bombers, when not actually escorting bombers, U.S. fighter planes often flew low-level sweeps intended, as Army Air Force uh, General uh, Karl Spatz wrote in April 1944, to impress Germans, civilians, with the declining ability of the Luftwaffe to protect them. German historian of the air war Horst Bogue writes that the American pilots often took this very literally and shot up grazing cows, pedestrians, cyclists, and farm carts. Famed post-war test pilot Chuck Yeager, and also World War II fighter ace, uh, writes in his autobiography about orders received by his 357th fighter group to strafe anything that moved within an assigned area of 2,500 square miles inside Germany. The object was to demoralize the German population, Yeager writes. Nobody asked us whether we were actually demoralizing the survivors or maybe enraging them to stage their own maximum effort. We were ordered to commit an atrocity, pure and simple, Jaeger's words. <clears throat> the answer to the question as to why downed Allied airmen were sometimes attacked would thus appear to be obvious. Although some Germans were able to view the ruination being rained down upon them as the just consequences of the colossal crimes committed by the regime that most of them had supported or at least tolerated, uh, others reacted with fury when the opportunity for revenge against their tormentors presented itself. But the actual story is somewhat more complex. Although some spontaneous violent, violence against Allied flyers was, was probably inevitable, given the duration and the intensity of the aerial assault on Germany, that violence was encouraged by the Nazi regime. In August 1943, the Reich leader of the SS and chief of the German police, Heinrich Himmler, by that time also Minister of the Interior, directed police personnel to abstain from intervening in attacks by German civilians on downed British and American air crew, whom he described as terror, flieger, terror flyers. That became the standard German term uh, for Allied flyers, terror flyers. In April 1944, German citizens were threatened with time in a concentration camp for being too friendly. Uh, to downed Allied flyers. And attacks on enemy airmen were openly encouraged by propaganda minister Josef Goebbels. <clears throat> In an editorial of May 1944, that was staggeringly hypocritical given Germany's own crimes, uh, and that was entitled A Word on the Enemy Air Terror. Goebbels accused Allied flyers of the willful targeting of German civilians, with much of his venom directed at fighter pilots who strafe non-combatants. Allied flyers guilty of these acts, he wrote, placed themselves outside the bounds of international law. If the perpetrators of such atrocities were to be captured, Goebbels continued, it would be inappropriate for German soldiers to protect them 
from the people's just desire for vengeance. In other words, Goebbels was arguing that Germans were entitled to ignore the Geneva Convention on POWs in regard to Allied flyers in, reply, in reprisal for Allied aerial atrocities. By their own actions, he was implying, they had excluded themselves from the protection of international law. And uh, uh, that the, the basic point that he was making was reinforced uh, by directives from the Nazi party leadership and by the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, the German uh, military high command. And um, Hitler's powerful personal secretary, Martin Bormann, directed that no German civilian or no German citizen was to be prosecuted uh, for attacking Allied flyers. Uh, and the natural consequence, I think, was that uh, attacks on Allied flyers, which had been relatively rare up until that point, increased in frequency. Uh, and we'll just look at a few examples. On the morning of August 4, 1944, B-17 number 909 of the 486th Bombardment Group of the 8th Air Force, piloted by Lieutenant Harvey Walthall, was on a mission to bomb an oil refinery in Hamburg. While executing a turn on the approach to the target, his plane collided with another B-17, sending both planes out of control. Two of the crew took to their parachutes, were captured, and survived the war. Meanwhile, Walthall and his co-pilots succeeded in bringing their plane under control and apparently attempted to nurse the aircraft back across the North Sea to Britain, but made it only as far as the German island of Borkum, uh, off uh, about 20 miles uh, uh, off the coast. And there they managed to execute a wheels up landing and the seven airmen surrendered without incident to German naval personnel. After being searched and briefly interrogated, they were marched towards the island's town on their way to an air base for evacuation to the mainland. As the procession entered the town, the prisoners were first beaten by spade wielding members of the German labor service. Farther on, they were greeted by townspeople lining the streets and the mayor and the local Nazi party boss, usually the two were the same, uh, who attempted to incite the crowd with shouts of, according to one witness, there you come, you murderers. How many women and children have you killed today? Civilians beat them and kicked them and knocked them down. Some of the townspeople responded as they had been encouraged to do, while the prisoners' guards made no effort to protect them. Still, the Americans might have survived had it not been for the appearance of an off-duty German soldier. Armed with a pistol and shouting that his wife and children had been killed in a bombing raid on Hamburg, he methodically shot each of the prisoners in the head. About three weeks later, B-24s of the 8th Air, Force, or 8th Air Force's 491st Bombardment Group bombed an airfield near Hanover. One of these was a Liberator piloted by L Lieutenant Norman Rogers with the racy nickname Wham Bam Thank You Ma'am, uh, whose crew was on its first combat mission. Shortly after releasing its bomb load on the target, Wham Bam took a flak burst that knocked out its hydraulic system and damaged three engines. With no chance of returning to base, the nine-man crew bailed out. Their treatment varied, reflecting the uneven effects of Goebbels' editorial, not to mention the threat to Germans inclined to be friendly. One crewman who had been slightly injured was given first aid and fed by a farmer on whose property he had come to earth. Sergeant Forrest Brennenstuhl, more seriously wounded by shrapnel from the flak burst, had his wound bathed by an elderly German couple and was then hospitalized prior to transfer to a POW camp from which he was liberated at the end of the war. Some members of Wham Bam's remaining crew were beaten uh, while being held at the local town hall uh, and then set out under guard by train the following day for the Luftwaffe's interrogation center at Oberursel uh, near Frankfurt. The trip was interrupted by damage to the rail line at Rüsselsheim, which had been heavily bombed by the RAF in the early hours of the same day. In an effort to circumvent the damage, the prisoners were marched by their three Luftwaffe guards through a section of town where, incited by an elderly uh, middle-aged woman who demanded vengeance for the devastation of the city, a mob attacked the prisoners with a shower of bricks and other debris, while their guards, as on Borkum, offered no protection. The fact that Rüsselsheim had been savaged by British and not American bombers had made no difference to the mob. 
To many Americans, all, uh, to, excuse me, to many Germans, all Allied airmen had long ago become terror fleeger, terror flyers. Six of the eight Americans died, four shot by a local party official, Nazi party official. Two survived by feigning death and escaping, only to be captured five days later, given medical treatment and sent to a POW camp where they lived out the remainder of the war. But most lynchings were not the products of spontaneous mob action, but were clearly premeditated acts of murder, often involving uh, persons in official positions. On July 29, 1944, for example, a, town can, uh, a down Canadian flyer was captured near the Bavarian town of Oberweyer. He was conducted to the town hall where the mayor and local party leaders decided that he should be killed. He was marched out of the town by a police official and shot. On March 31, 1945, little more than a month before the fighting ended, an RAF Lancaster of Bomber Command's number 635 squadron was shot down in an attack on Hamburg. Sergeant K.G. Clark was taken prisoner and held in an, army, in an armory in Glinda, from which he was to be taken by three members of the Volkssturm, which was the militia organized by the Nazis in the fall of 1944, uh, to nearby Rheinbeck. Two of the militiamen, reputed to be fanatical Nazis, conspired to murder the prisoner and shot him about 20 miles into the march. Following an attack on the air base at Dreyerwalde on March 21, 1945, five British airmen were captured, and orders were given to escort them to a POW camp. Command of the escort was given to Army Oberfeldwebel Karl Amberger, in spite of his well-known hostility to Allied airmen. The five were shot, allegedly, while trying to escape. SS men, labor service members, local party, Nazi party leaders, um, Gestapo members, police officials, all in various situations uh, murdered downed Allied airmen. Some seriously injured prisoners died simply as a result of being intentionally denied medical treatment. There were some inci incidents with bizarre twists. In March 1945, Oberleutnant Stempel, a Luftwaffe fighter pilot, fell an unintended victim to some of his countrymen's desire for vengeance. Having parachuted from his stricken Focke-Wulf 190 fighter, he was mistaken for an allied, uh, allied flyer and beaten to death. Sergeant Edward Sumier was shot by Carl Senf, a police official of Hermsdorf, following the shooting down of Sumier's B-17 on August 24, 1944. When American troops entered the town eight months later, Senf was betrayed to them by another town resident, whereupon the Americans, resorting to a bit of lynch justice of their own, put Senf against a wall and shot him. Allied airmen were acutely aware of the danger they faced if downed over Germany. Lieutenant Bernard Herding, Harding, excuse me, pilot of a B-24 shot down on July 7, 1944, was captured by three farmers who imprisoned him in a cellar in a nearby village. Fearing violence from the locals, he buried his pilot's wings in the cellar floor, uh, but survived to return to the village at age 90 uh, to retrieve them. By the way, he couldn't find them. Uh, Sergeant John Briel, whom I quoted earlier, confided to his diary in reaction to blind bombing raids by the 8th Air Force that if we fall into most German hands now, they will kill us. Uh, that was an exaggeration. Although Goebbels claims in his diary that his editorial had had a spectacular effect, actually relatively few Germans participated in the murders of Allied flyers, and some German military personnel did, in fact, protect prisoners from aggressive civilians. Author Adam Makos writes that almost all of the former captured Army Air Force veterans he interviewed recalled feelings of relief at the appearance of German airmen. I was never so glad to see the Luftwaffe, uh, one man told him. Some Germans showed humanity in spite of the riskiness of such behavior. Uh, I've already noted the decency shown to two members of Wham Bam's crew. In another case, Lieutenant Matthew Radnowski, navigator on a B-17, wounded when his plane was shot down in November 1944, recalled lying on the ground surrounded by local women bending over him and weeping sympathetically. He was carried to a nearby hospital where he received two months of excellent care before being transferred to a POW camp. Lieutenant Alexander Jefferson, a Tuskegee Airman with the 332nd Fighter Group, 
was shot down in his P-51 in August 1944 and captured. Later, recalling that he had, got, he had received more respect and fairness from his German captors than he had gotten from some white American officers. While being transported to a POW camp, he and two other captured Mustang pilots were menaced by a contingent of <laughs> fanatical Hitler youth but were protected by their German guards who threatened to fire on the aggressive teenagers. Following the end of the war, Allied occupation forces investigated reports of the murders and beatings of downed airmen and brought many of the, the alleged perpetrators to trial. The US Army alone conducted over 200 such trials before military commissions. Many alleged perpetrators were convicted and hanged or imprisoned. Three of the participants in the Borkum atrocity and five in the Rüsselsheim murders, for example, went to the gallows. There was understandably little sympathy in Allied populations for the murderers of American and British airmen, but surprisingly, there was some. Ellery Stoll, an eminent American scholar of international law who was no coddler of the enemy. He supported aerial attacks on civilian populations as military necessities, urged leniency in these cases. He wrote shortly after the war that we should take into account the emotional strain of bombed civilians who have lost their homes and loved ones through what they erroneously believed were acts in violation of the laws of war. A woman named Isabel Summers wrote to the wife of the chief defense attorney in the Rüsselsheim case that anyone on earth would do as they do, it, uh, as they did. It's not in human nature to see your, your home bombed, your children writhing in agony, and not want to attack the killers. U.S. Army Major Burton Ellis was in Germany to try Germans accused of war crimes and would lead the prosecution of the high-profile Malmody massacre case, securing the conviction of all 73 defendants. After having viewed the ruins of Darmstadt, heavily bombed by the RAF in September 1944 with a loss of over 12,000 largely civilian lives, Ellis wrote to his wife, it was leveled block after block with nothing but burnt out skeletons of apartment houses. If your family, your home, your possessions were buried there, what would your reaction be? The people that lived there beat some airmen to death. I can see why they did what they did. I would have done likewise. The number of Allied airmen, can, uh, of Allied airmen murdered could never be known with precision. Any, of course, are too many, but the total is undoubtedly small relative to the, number, to the number of Allied flyers captured. If the estimate of 350 deaths is correct, and that comes from a study done by Barbara Grimm in Germany, if the estimate of 350 total deaths is correct, they represent less than 1% of the total number of British and American airmen captured, the vast majority of whom survived the war. Now, what motivated the Nazi leadership to condone and encourage these murders? Um, was it a naive effort to deter Allied air attacks, or at least to demoralize Allied flyers? Perhaps blind fury directed against a force that was reducing the thousand-year Reich to rubble? Maybe it was part of a broader effort to radicalize the German people for fighting to the death as her enemies closed in around her. Maybe all of these things. What is beyond speculation is that hundreds of Allied airmen suffered uh, and died as a consequence. Thank you. And first, thanks to Günter Bischof uh, for the introduction. We are now taking a closer look at the southern part of the German Reich and its fear of, of influence, focusing on war crimes committed against downed Allied airmen in the Austrian and Hungarian area between 1943 and 1945. We've put this under the title of Lynch Law is the Rule. Uh, th that's a statement given by the German Minister of Propaganda, Josef Goebbels, in 1944 regarding public violence against downed airmen. This statement, and especially its meaning and the consequences, are in the center of the following presentation, which my colleague and I will give together. Let me start the presentation um, with showing you an excerpt of a letter a letter which was found by US troops at the belongings of a German POW. The letter was written by his father, mainly describing an air attack on the city of Vienna in May 1944. 
Within these descriptions, there were the following sentences, quote, lately we have often made the personal acquaintance of Americans who were shot down. They look just like vagabonds, wrecked, anticipated, regular underworld beings, also their officers. They are killed like dogs by the civilians here out of rage, unquote. What is he describing? Well, we know now that this incident happened in Vienna on 24th of May 1944, immediately after the suburbs of Vienna had been bombed that day. But what is really important about those sentences, despite his description of a war crime, of course, is how he's telling it. So what we have here is a coherence between the perception of a specific warfare deep within the hinterland and the interpretation of the role of society and role of combatants within this warfare. Let me tell you this, that this perception as well as the inter this interpretation strongly influenced the point of view we still have today regarding those specific war crimes. So when talking about the state of research, let me give you an overview. Jörg Friedrich, a German historian, for example, wrote in his book, The Fire, uh, quote, retaliation by an outraged populace, unquote. Or Klaus Michael Malmann, also, also a German historian, affirmed this in stating that those crimes were committed in the heat of passion and are strongly linked with air warfare. So you can see that the current point of view is that lynch law committed against downed airmen was lynch law by the populace. And of course, the meaning of the word lynch law also gives this impression. Of course, that's an assumption which is not proven yet and which is, in addition, mainly focusing on today's Germany, as this was the main target area of Allied strategic bombing. Within this area, it seems like that there was a close connection between the escalation of air war, like the historian Dietmar Süß puts it, and the outbreak of public violence. But what about the peripheral areas of bomb war, like Austria, Hungary, where air war started much later? Well, the question is in the center of our research efforts. Um, we have worked on this, and still working, of course, at several research projects, as you can see, projects like in German, Flieger Lynchjustiz, so lynch law committed against downed airmen, or terror flyers, that's the project, um, and the reason why we're here at New Orleans at the moment, and several projects for the Austrian Department of Defense dealing with specific war crime cases. So these projects are all touching this topic, and are focusing on the area of today's Austria and parts of Hungary. And they are dealing with the key question, what was behind these specific war crimes, especially regarding the strong influence and perception of those crimes um, by the German propaganda. To show you the results of our research, the presentation is structured as follows. Um, I will be begin with the topic air war and perception in this area. Then my colleague Nicole will t take a look at the reaction by the Nazi system, especially regarding the enemy stereotype and the concept of the en enemy, the so-called terror, terror flieger. We've already heard about it. The next chapter is focusing on war crimes as a consequence of the reaction within this area. And in order to highlight this, I will show you some case studies. Last but not least, we will give a short conclusion. Okay, let's start with the first part, air war and perception. So if you go back to the day and place mentioned, um, in the letter I showed, at, I showed at the beginning, so the 24th of May and Vienna, we can found, find some remarkable things. For instance, the fact that not the city was the main target, but some air bases around Vienna. But let's take a, a, um, a look at the broader picture. So when uh, taking a look at the map, you can see that Austria, that the Austrian area wasn't included into the strategic air war from the very beginning on, as this area was out of reach for planes coming from England. So it was not earlier than in August 1943 when Allied air bases had been in, installed, especially in Italy, and the 15th US Army Air Force, that this area came within reach. Of course, installing a totally new theater of war at the, Mediter at the Mediterranean needed time. So the attack on 24th of May 44 was the 34th on the Austrian area, out of roughly 700 until the end of war. Speaking about Hungary, only five attacks had taken place until May due to the fact of secret negotiations between the Hungarian government and the Allied powers. One could say that the 24th of May doesn't mark a peak of air war in this area, but more or less the beginning. 
Nevertheless, a big show of air war and also an enemy stereotype already existed, mainly influenced by the attacks against the rest of the German Reich, so especially Hamburg in summer 1943. And the picture the Nazi propaganda was drawing. So let's take a closer look at the latter aspect. At first, air war created a totally new and different perception of warfare. Deep within the hinterland, uh, without steady and visible front lines, and directly affecting the population. So the Nazi party was fully aware um, of those effects even before the outbreak of war. In 1936, for example, Alfred Rosenberg, the chief ideologist of the Nazi party, the Nazi movement, wrote down in his book that, um, I will translate it, air war and the involvement of the population would integrate the leather into the whole warfare and give them the feeling that this is a struggle for their own survival and that there is no choice whether to fight or not. All in all, for Rosenberg, a desirable perception, as this would create identification effects with the regime and warfare. So from the beginning on, the interpretation of air, for, uh, air warfare was included into the early concept of total war, and therefore into one of the key elements of the Nazi system. It is important that the whole air war was defined not only as war against the population, but also as war carried out by them, creating totally new perspectives of, of warfare. So the fighting civilian at the, at the front line, whatever fight and front line means. Of course, the perception of the population, especially after summer of 1943, looked slightly different, as the German capability to protect and defend the people was dwindling. So air war and its psychological impacts, like fear, didn't affect the population as a whole, rather than single persons, of course. So consequently, a single person experienced an air raid as an invisible threat from the point of view of air raid shelters. It was therefore an incalculable threat, so you have to wait for it uh, for hours and don't know when and if bombs will fall or not. The attack came from a high altitude, which creates the feeling that the bombers are totally out of reach. And as it seems that no military countermeasures showed any results, the feeling was given that the enemy was predominant. This all produced inactiveness, as the people had to wait until the end of an alarm. So the important part of that all was the endurance of threat. It became significant in air war. Um, let me show you this with an audio record from an air attack recorded inside an air raid shelter. Um, the first part of this is an announcement of a coming attack. Uh, then you will hear the sirens howling, the engines of the bomber planes, and afterwards the explosions of the bombs. OK, this one doesn't work. Okay, maybe we'll try in the end. Uh, sorry for that. Um, let's go further. Um, let's put this all into a structure. So air war produced certain kinds of threat that had a great influence on the individual, leaving them alone with their fear. The whole perception of air war is in this way dominated by endurance of, of threat, leaving no space behind for any opportunity of action carried out by the individual person. So this creates kind of a vicious circle which was very dangerous for the Nazi regime, as they didn't play any role within this circle. So the regime has to react. Here you can see how dangerous the, the situation appears to be for the Nazi regime. Here's a file produced by the regime, which is giving an, um, a good impression. It's a report from the Reichssicherheitsdienst, so the, the Reich Security Service, uh, talking about the hostile attitude of Viennese working men after air raids. So what's did the regime do? At first, a wide variety of special civil countermeasures were developed by the regime. This included various types of civil defense being implemented, air raid protection before the bombing, and victim assistance. The so called Opferfürsorge in its aftermath. People were assigned to create it and organize communities, uh, which were under strong influence and control of the Nazi authorities. So the historian, the German historian Dietmar Süß, and also Richard Overy, refer to it with the terms air raid shelter community or community of faith. 
By the German propaganda, these communities, communities were interpreted as especially military communities. So civil air defense was defined as combat. The population in air war, especially air raid wardens, were combatants. And the victims of the bomb attacks were buried with military honors as fallen heroes. You can see this at the picture on the left side. So this goes far beyond an interpretation. This was a construction of, of a role of society in air war, created by German propaganda. So let's go back to the structure and the vicious circle. Here you can see what happened. The Nazi regime tried literally to collect individual persons in air war, in communities, in order to split the threat. So a, a sorrow share is a sor sorrow half, of course, and to give them the opportunities for action. This creates a new circle, which was dominated by the interaction between the population and the Nazi regime, which is an important new perspective regarding air war. OK, now it's your part. Yeah. OK, the next part we would like to present to you is the concept of the enemy. Thank you. So when talking about perceptions, interpretation, and especially social construction in the context of aerial warfare, we will have to take a closer look at the picture of air war itself, of course, and of course the people that were involved, the airmen, as personification of the air war on whom the concept of the enemy and the air was based on. So let's go back to the 24th May 1945 for and Vienna, our master example. By following our remarks, you will see that this is a really a key point and date. So let's take a look at some newspapers of the following day and some posters which were hanged up in the public in order to be able to reconstruct the different phases of development, of development sorry, within the concept of the enemy by German authorities. By looking at these newspaper articles, here you can see the Völkische Beobachter uh, for Vienna. One can one can see the reports about these air attacks. The headlines are talking about terror attacks or air hunts who defile Vienna. So this first phase was mainly based on an explanation and interpretation of air war. To cover up their inferiority, Allied aerial warfare was characterized not as a military action, but as a crime committed against the population and especially defined communities. The Nazi propaganda creates terms like Luft terror or air terror or Kindermord, child murder, as you can see on the posters on the right, to support the picture they were drawing. This was, of course, an easy concept to distract from the inability to protect their own population. This started already in 1942, before air war had reached Austria or Hungary. The main goal behind this was to create emotions and especially hatred which seems to be stronger than fear. In order not to create the impression of inactiveness or inferiority, this was strongly linked from the beginning on with announcements and promises of retaliation um, with a wide variety of interpretation as you think of air attacks on England or the one dollar secret weapons. The next step within this development was a personification of the concept of the enemy as the bomber crews were the only available elements of Allied air war. You can easily find this in some newspaper articles of the same day showing pictures of downed airmen with captions like the air gangsters flew against Vienna again. In November 1943, there was a visible change within the air war propaganda. Although Joseph Goebbels still was drawing the picture of air war as a big crime, especially after the air raids against Hamburg in the summer of 1943, he started to focus on the men who fought the air war in their planes, the airmen. The key case was the so-called murder incident. In November 1943, Lieutenant Kenneth Williams, a bombardier of a P-24 Liberator, was captured near Bremen. At the back of his jacket, there was the letter written, Murder Inc., the name of his plane. Goebbels and the German propaganda immediately concentrated on Williams, starting a propaganda offensive which lasted until the end of war, telling the story that Americans are recruiting gangsters from Chicago. This was one of the key sentences they used to kill German children and to extinguish the German populace. I quote, he is living proof of America's murder lust. He belongs to America's secret weapon, a mass murder league, which has been set loose against us, unquote. 
Goebbels not only published William's name and picture in the Völkische Beobachter, for example, but also his home address and names of family members. So this, as you can see, what these measures were really far-reaching and especially in creating an enemy stereotype. This new way was given by the fact that the downing of an air crew could easily be interpreted as victory against the enemy in the air. On this picture, you can see a US crew paying out south of Vienna. For the population or the communities, this marked a specific moment of psychological transition from inferiority inside the air shelter to superiority when, for example, a plane crashed and a wounded airman landed on the ground. The propaganda now mainly focused on that aspect. On the right side, you can see the pictures where, which were shown on the German Wochenschau, like the dead airmen and the capture of um, airmen. But let's take a look at the next step of Nazi propaganda. In some newspaper articles of the same day, you can also find statements and even pictures which are addressing a special reaction and aspects of public violence against airmen. The articles at this slide have captions like, a quote, the end of the terror flyers, or this airman was not lynched by the population yet, so as if lynching was common knowledge. In fact, what we have here is an accumulation of all those propagandistic phases and developments. And of course, this is not by chance. So let's take a look at that. While this development was part of a planning, planning process going on during those days, let me summarize the different phases. If you define a crime, afterwards the perpetrators, the next step would be sanctioning and punishment. For a short time, Goebbels and Hitler planned to execute show trials on downed airmen, especially on, the, on Kenneth Williams. This was quickly discarded as too inefficient in terms of popular involvement, and during May, a plane com plan combining lynch law by an outraged public and a corresponding propagandistic interpretation was made and adopted during a meeting of German authorities at the Obersalzberg at the 6th June 1944. The result of the meeting was, from now on, I quote, lynch law is the, the rule. Accordingly, the plan was to create public lynching carried out not by Nazi officials, but by the population. To highlight this, I, this aspect, I uh, want to play a, a part of a speech which uh, Joseph Goebbels gave on the 4th of June, 1944, only a few days after the incidents in Vienna and in the midst of the planning process. Yes. So. Jagdflieger zur Selbsthilfe geschreckt. Sie hat sie erschlagen. Oder ihnen die Hälse durchgeschnitten. Und ähnliches. Wir vergießen deshalb keine Krokodilstränen. Und die, die das getan haben, werden deshalb nicht aufs Schafott geführt. So verrückt sind wir nicht. Wir können diese Wut der Bevölkerung sehr gut verstehen. Und die englischen und amerikanischen Piloten müssen sich darüber klar sein, wenn sie weiter so fortfahren wie bisher, so wird das deutsche Volk ihnen eine Antwort geben, die ihnen alles andere nur kein Vergnügen bereiten wird. Okay, it worked. <laughs> so in addition, and that were the consequences of the Oversalzberg meeting. Measures were taken within the civil administration and especially within regional and local structures of the Nazi party. As one example, as you can see here, Ernst Kaltenbrunner, the chief of the Reichssicherheitshauptamt, ordered, I quote, pogroms of the populace against English and, English and American terror flies are not to be interfered with. On the contrary, this hostile mood is to be encouraged, unquote. As a result of this meeting, Order, oral orders on all levels of the Nazi party system were given, like the one by the Gauleiter of Oberdona, August Eichrober. He spoke about, I quote, public, ex public execution of any Allied airmen taken prisoner, unquote. But we can say now, regarding the information and files we collected, the 24th May 1944 was really the starting point of an organized lynch law against downed airmen in the area of today's Austria. 
To successfully implement these plans, it was necessary for lynching to be carried out by these local communities as a whole, led by their prominent members. Another important requirement was that these killings took place in the public and were done by civilians in order to keep the official orchestration out of sight and enable the crime be defined as revenge by the local communities. Contrary to the later common perception, everything including the perpetrators, the victims and witnesses, the role of communities was predefined and established in, a, in advance. So what we have is a full construction of a war crime. So this leads us to the next chapter. chapter sorry. We will now take a closer look on the Nazi planning on the so-called Lynch law, focusing on the Austrian and Hungarian area. In the first step, we collected, as Günther sa already said, data in order to get information about the fate of downed airmen. So as you can see, we created a database, including every US, British, Canadian, South African, Australian, and New Zealand airman who was shot down over Austria and Hungary, and if he survived the crash, we traced, we traced him until his death or liberation. So let me show you this on a map. Between 1943 and 1945, 533 planes crashed within Austria. 5,038 airmen had been on board of these planes. About 40% died in the crash, and on the map you can see the places where they crashed. Of course, the main crash place, places are near the bigger cities, which are the main targets of the air raids and were um, focused on the eastern part of Austria. When talking about Hungary, the, the numbers are slightly different. 285 planes and 1,987 airmen crashed. That means 93% of airmen who were downed over Austria and Hungary came from the United States. So this shows that this was really an American front line. 60 air airmen, or, or roughly 1% of them, came from Louisiana. The next map shows you um, all war crimes we detected. The yellow stars are showing the places of the crimes. We found out that 214 crimes took place in Austria and that 89 airmen were murdered there. In Hungary, um, 190 war crimes took place and 44 airmen had been murdered. But let's stay in Austria. The concentration of the places is slightly different. You can see an agglomeration around three main cities, Linz, Vienna, and Graz. And if you also include the others, you can discover roughly two main lines of crimes. This is a very important discovery as those lines are marking the transportation lines. Downed airmen had first to be captured, then afterwards they were concentrated at some air bases of the German Luftwaffe, like in Hörsching near Linz, Thalhof near Graz, or Zeltweg. These are marked with tots, the red tots. Afterwards, they were transported along those lines to the so-called Dulac Luft, or interrogation camp near Frankfurt, or later uh, on Munich. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why is this concentration of crimes along the transportation lines? The explanation is there is no direct link between air raids and lynch law, the main argument of a crime in the heat of the moment. And the concentration along the transportation lines is a proof of that. We'll give you an example of that later. But first, let me highlight this aspect regarding the question if there is a connection between air attacks and war crimes. The following statistics uh, is showing three parameters. The back row represents the number of air raids or air attacks on Austrian and Hungarian targets. The mid row shows the number of crashes and the front row the number of war crimes. Within the first month, as you can see here, it's from August 43 to April 44, you can see that air war was at a low level, although the number of crashes was increasing. But hardly any war crime happened. From May on, our initial date, you can see that the number of war crimes was, es was escalating, although air attacks was co are constantly at a low level. In October 1944, air war really started with large offensive attacks. Interestingly, the, mum the number of war crimes is increasing. And the last point, this was, this was changing in Feb February 1945, when pl plans for lynch law were started again. So 
let's summarize the results we gained. So we found out that the lynch law was a plain crime, a war crime against or organized by Nazi authorities carried out in the public uh, with the goal to prevent negative psychological effects on the population who experienced the bombings. The victims, the airmen, the offenders, and the witnesses, the population, had been predefined. Then there is hardly any link between the air raids and the murder. And 80% of the murderers were Nazi officials, like Professor Weingarten mentioned. So they were Gestapo men, um, or Waffen SS officers, or soldiers, or so on. So the theory that lynch law was carried out by the population is a rumor. The lynch law was a specific interaction between the population and the Nazi regime, and therefore a demonstration of power of the regime. It has created large effects on this collective memory, even today in Austria and Hungary. And to show the consequences, my colleague now will give some examples of different war crime cases which took place in Austria and Hungary. Uh, thanks, Nicole. Um, well, I now want to show you three different kinds uh, of war crime cases in order to highlight the things Nicole already mentioned. The first case um, is dealing with a crime which occurred alongside the BOW uh, transportation lines. It is the so-called Amstetten case. Well, we call it Amstetten case, of course. So this case will show you that those crimes had been reconstructed to a high degree and that there was no direct link with previous air attacks. It is, in fact, a, so to say, serial crime, as each deed followed the other. Um, and this is, it is the story of the crew of Murray G. Stowe from Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, a pilot of a B-24 Liberator, which crashed on 12th of March uh, 1945 near a Hungarian town called Lente. On the left picture, you can see Murray Stowe. The rest, is showing, the rest of the pictures are showing uh, his crew, which consisted of um, 10 men. Let's show the story on the map. Um, as I said before, the plane crashed in Hungary. So you can see this on the right side, on the right lower side. The whole crew was captured by Hungarian SS troops, who brutally murdered two crew members named Alschlager and Van Huysen. They are still missing in action. So uh, of course, we, we, don't have, uh, we don't know um, the exact circumstances of their death. The rest of the crew was transported to Vienna via train. As you, as you can see on the map. They had met other air crews who had been shot down over Hungary and in the vicinity of Vienna. So during the following hours, the whole group crossed to a number of about 150 airmen, still guarded by SS troops. In the afternoon of the third day, all of them were taken out of prison and were marched through the streets of Vienna, where party officials had called together a crowd and had given them cobblestones. Several airmen stated that those stones were thrown on them, uh, killed at least one airman. And they saw that the second one was hanged at the lampposts. So that's very similar to the things we already mentioned regarding the 24th of May 1944. The, serving, um, the surviving airmen were transported away from Vienna the next day, again via train, but this train stopped at Amstetten, a, a small town. And the same things happened again. So here you can see the map, um, a map drawn by one of the perpetrators showing the whole scene in Amstetten. And on the left side, you can see the picture of the main square of the city where the crime took place. The, the dots, the white dots in the middle of, of the map are giving the airmen who are, were surrounded by people armed with stones and sticks. So the officer in charge was Franz Zierreis, um, SS officer from the concentration camp Mauthausen. He was, in, he was involved in three other very similar lynch law cases. But back to Amstetten, this was not the end of the ordeal. The last station of the transport was Linz. Only two months later, when Baton's army, army entered the city, they found the bodies of two airmen who had been hanged at the lamppost there. So you can see that those airmen went through several war crimes, but not as a result of their appearance at a specific place, so soon after an air raid, for example, not even after the crash of a plane, but because of the will of Nazi officials to instrumentalize them and to hand them over to public violence, which was prearranged at different places. This leads to the next case. 
um, a case which is dealing with a parallel war crime. So if, uh, as things happen simultaneously on different places, again, have in mind the question, does this happen in the heat of the moment? The case is touching the fate um, of a B-24 Liberator crew commanded by Lieutenant James M. Crockett from Kentucky and his co-pilot McDonald Moore from Connecticut. You can see pictures of them on the left. Uh, Moore is still alive and told us his story last October in Washington, D.C. Their plane was part of an attack on the Austrian city of Graz um, on 4th of March, 1945, one of the major attacks which left very heavy destruction within the northern part of the city. The plane was severely damaged um, by air defense fire, so the whole nose part was shot off. The crew immediately uh, bailed out and reached the ground on three dif dif different locations. Two crew members, one of them was Stephen Kudrak from Pennsylvania, you can see his pictures on, on the right upper side, landed south um, of the crash place. They were immediately surrounded by hundreds of civilians who didn't behave in a hostile way at first. Um, suddenly, SS and Nazi party officials appeared and ordered the executions of those airmen. Um, as nobody reacted on that, uh, SS Lieutenant Markus Lienhardt, you can see his, pictures on the left, his picture on the left side, a resident of the small city there, uh, stepped forward. The airmen had to kneel down and were executed. Not far away from the spot, the fourth airman was murdered in exactly the same manner, um, also in front of hundreds of people. But what happened to Moore? He was captured north within the area that was attacked this day. Interestingly, he was rescued by the civilians there. As no party member arrived at the spot, so all of them went to the southern places. But a few hours later, the same Nazi authorities who had been involved in the murder of his comrades started to search for him. They found him at a police station and immediately gave orders to execute him. But instead of following those orders, the policeman in charge released him during the night and faked his execution. Um, you can see a photo, photograph of one of those policemen um, on the lower right side. His name is Heinrich Leerbauer. The bodies of the other crew members were shown publicly as kind of victory trophy. Um, the next one, after the end, um, no, on, on this slide you can see the written order to kill Moore, uh, the upper picture. Um, two dog, dog tags belonging to the murdered crew members we were able to find, and a picture of a memorial stone which reminds on the murder of three airmen, although four had been murdered that day, definitely, and two others probably. They are still missing in action. After the end of war, um, several war crime trials took place touching this very incident. This was given by the fact that this was not only a single crime, but part of a bigger crime complex between the western part of Hungary and the Kratz area, including the same perpetrators and also including US and British airmen as victims. So in 2011, we were able to detect a mass grave not far away from the crime scene, but that's in fact another story. In fact, the whole case is still unsolved. But what is interesting is that there is a similarity between this crime and the first case I mentioned, um, especially, especially regarding the perpetrators. In this case, two SS officers had been involved, the German Wilhelm Schweitzer and the Hungarian SS officer Karoy Ney, both, both also involved in five other war crimes committed against airmen. That's of course not coincidentally, but indicates that those crimes were prearranged given by the fact of a very consistent group of perpetrators. The next case deals with the motive of racism and also shows that there is no close connection between previous air raids and the outbreak of violence. On 1st of April 1945, a heavy air fight between fighters of the German Kampfgeschwader 27 and the Das Kigiamen from um, 332nd Fighter Group took place over Linz. The Germans succeeded in shooting down uh, the B-51 Mustang of Lieutenant Walter Manning from um, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, near Linz. Um, this is a picture of him and his crashed plane. Manning wasn't hurt when he reached the ground. He was immediately captured and taken to the nearby air base at Hershing. He was put into solitary confinement and interrogated, as we know now, 
heavily tortured during the next few days for being an, quote, African ape, unquote. And on 3rd of April at nightfall, he was taken out of his cell by a group of SS and Luftwaffe officers. They mistreated him and took him to a lamppost where they hanged him. But not enough, they put a blade around his neck with the inscription, Via Wolf. So this map on the right side uh, is giving the whole scene again. It shows the place where, where he was murdered and where he was buried. On the right side, you can see some photographs and drawings from a local newspaper published between 1st and 3rd of April, 1945. They give a very good impression how the whole situation was influenced, controlled, and deliber deliberately escalated by propaganda and local authorities. Pictures of black airmen were shown within newspaper articles and cross connection and the cross connection was built up to the hanging of black men in the southern part of the United States. So you can see the reference to the Ku Klux Klan picture. This, also increased, this all increased at the day Manning was shot down. After the crime, the body of Manning was shown again to the public. Um, in the meanwhile, a propagandistic interpretation started creating the picture and circulating rumors that the American was killed by a large group of persons uh, in revenge of, quote, the killing of German children, unquote. So the whole case wasn't hushed up, although there had been very good opp opportunities to do so. On the contrary, information and their interpretation were published deliberately and purposefully. So the case of Manning was never solved, although some information existed, for instance, from other airmen, especially from the Stoke crew I already mentioned. Okay, let's um, come to the conclusion. Um, we have talked. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, we have talked about the different levels of perception of aerial warfare within the society that experienced bombings and interpretation of the Nazi regime. We have also analyzed the construction of the communities as kind of countermeasures to weaken the psychological effects of bombing. This construction was at least a passive one, so it needed active components. The first step to reach this goal was the creation and interpretation of a concept of the enemy which leads to a personification of air war propaganda. From that point on, it was the goal of the Nazi regime to transform hatred and anger into violence against downed airmen. The whole process was a planned one and didn't happen by chance or by itself. The goal of the Nazi regime was to canalize the anger of the population and to give them an attackable enemy in order to stabilize their own power, which was threatened by air war until the end of war. This was especially true for the Austrian and also the Hungarian area, um, where the crime rate was much higher than in Germany, uh, seen in relation with the crashed planes and crews. Okay, let's now come to an end. Thank you very much for your attention. Instead of showing you the last picture, let me show you the names of the airmen from Louisiana who had been shot down of Austria and Hungary during World War II. And again, thank you. Good evening. Uh, let me ask a question to begin with. Uh, just curious. Um, how many of you are local? I guess raise your hand, Louisiana people. Okay, it looks like most of you are. Uh, uh, I moved back to um, New Orleans last year. As Gunter said, I was a reporter for the Times Picayune in the uh, in the early 90s, I wrote all the big stories on David Duke and, and casino gambling. And then I went off to the Miami Herald, and I was a foreign correspondent. And um, for the 2011, 2012, for that academic year, I was at Harvard University on something called a Neiman Fellowship. So a year ago, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. Where, where was I going to go? And I made a decision that I wanted to return to New Orleans. Um, the food, the music, the culture, the people, um, and the kinds of fun stories you get to do. And in my year at Harvard, I studied di digital journalism and um, all the kind of new ways that people are getting their news, like, you know, from these sorts of things. So um, I made a decision to come back here, and because I studied digital journalism, um, I came uh, to work for something called The Lens. I don't know if you haven't, if you haven't had a chance to see it, please check us out, thelensnola.org. Um, we're a digital news site. We're a nonprofit. We're reader-supported um, 
kind of like NPR, uh, uh, people give donations and uh, foundations give us money. Uh, I'm particularly writing about Governor Jindal. I had a big story yesterday uh, about Governor Jindal and, and his tax plan, his popularity going into the session. I, I did another pretty big story today uh, that will be posted tomorrow morning, and I hope you get a chance to check out The Lens. But I started work at, at The Lens on October 1st um, last year, October 1st, 2012. And I want to tell you a story about something that began on October 1st, 1943. And on that day, 26 uh, B-24 bombers took off from an airfield uh, in Tunis, Tunisia. And their target was Austria, sort of appropriately, uh, a city just south of, uh, of Vienna called Wiener Neustadt. And it, within those, uh, among those 26 bombers, um, there was a plane called the Fascinating Witch. And the plane had flown in the Ploesti raid. I'm sure a lot of you heard of the Ploesti raid. Flown in the Ploesti raid and had been damaged. And it wasn't supposed to fly on this October 1st uh, raid to Wiener Neustadt. Uh, but the pilot was really gung-ho, and he, and he talked into his commanding officer into letting him fly that day, although the plane had been grounded. And, and sure enough, on the way to target, the plane began to have engine trouble. And uh, the pilot uh, uh, made the decision. Uh, you know, he had faced with the decision whether to keep going or turn around. Uh, he made a decision to, to keep going towards the target with that B-24 called the Fascinating Witch. And they, they had been told in the briefing that morning that it was going to be a milk run because they had bombed Wiener Neustadt in August of 43, you know, just six weeks earlier, and there had been no German defenses. But what they didn't know is that, that Hitler flew into a rage after that attack. It was the first one on Austria. Um, and, you know, he was born in Austria. And so the Luftwaffe put up defenses that the intelligence people for the United States did not know about. And so they were met that day, those 26 bombers, by very heavy flak and, um, um, and fighters. And uh, the fascinating witch was hit uh, just, after hitting, uh, just after dropping its bombs on the target over Wiener Neustadt, where there was a, a Messerschmitt uh, plant. And uh, the plane was hit, and it became evident very quickly that the, the plane wasn't going to make it. And uh, the pilot gave the order to, to bail out, and six guys jumped out of the plane uh, and the plane was on fire by now. Um, uh, six guys jumped out of the plane and uh, uh, ended up floating towards Earth. And uh, while they were floating towards Earth, they saw the plane explode, the, fla the fascinating witch exploded. Um, and while they were floating down, uh, and, and then they gathered the next day, and they, 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 they compared notes, the six who were captured in Austria, and they, they, they compared notes. They knew that three guys on board the fascinating witch had died. And then, you know, every plane had 10 guys. What they didn't know was what happened to the pilot. He was still on board when those guys jumped off, and then the plane exploded. Um, the pilot died in 2003. He was my father. And um, he was the guy who made the decision to fly that day, um, even though he shouldn't have, and to keep going to the target when, uh, when they should have turned around, probably, and three men died, and six men spent the rest of the war in prisoner war camp. Uh, my father, um, he landed in, he, he was on the plane when it exploded. And somehow he survived that. And somehow his parachute opened. And because he, he didn't like to fly with his, with his boots on, uh, with his army shoes on, he, had, he didn't have his boots on um, at the moment that the plane exploded. I'm sorry, I'm getting screwed up. But he didn't, anyway, he ended up par parachuting off. He ended up with the explosion. He didn't have his boots on. So he ends up on the ground. He's bloody from the explosion. He's burned from the explosion. And he's barefoot. And he's in a little village called Pilgersdorf, south of Vienna, south of Wiener Neustadt. And he's in the woods. He, he, he lands in a tree. And he ends up trying to figure out where to go. And he ends up uh, um, ending up on a, on a trail He's trying to get to Yugoslavia. That's what he was told, get to Yugoslavia. And um, he spends a night in the woods, but he finds this trail with some markings on a tree. Then he thinks, well, let me just go this way. And, and he, he, he uh, spends the night in the woods. He, you know, he's, again, bloody, burned, barefoot. He's cold, but nobody sees him. And in the morning, he keeps going, kind of stumbling along. And, and um, 
he ends up, uh, when he finally sees somebody, he sees a, a young man with a, uh, a patch on his shoulder that he knew that he read, he, he knew that it was meant that the guy was in the Hungarian army. My father had crossed the border into Hungary and he surrendered at that point. This is now October 2nd, 1943. And um, the Hungarians did not know what to do with him. My father was the first American prisoner of war in Hungary. And, and it, uh, they put him in a hospital and they took care of him. And um, my father didn't realize this, but I found out of my research, because I've ended up writing, um, I don't know if to call the book, because it's not yet published. Um, but uh, what he did not know is that during that time, the Hungarian government was trying to, uh, they were allied with Germany, but, he, but uh, uh, the leaders of Hungary didn't want to remain allied with Germany, and so they were carrying out these secret negotiations with Hungary. So they saw my father as a way of kind of winning some good favor with the Hungarians, I mean, with the, with the Americans. And my father was sent to a, a, an estate where he was served lunch by a, a waiter. You can imagine these other six POWs uh, who were on his plane were in a you know, bad condition somewhere uh, in, in the German area. Uh, when my father was in this beautiful estate home and he could walk into the next village and, uh, and, and, and I said he was the first one, but other Americans began showing up, and a guy named Glenn Loveland was also, he was shot down over Bremen and, and had this, uh, one, of these, one of these guys that kept escaping, kept escaping, and finally made it to uh, Hungary as well, and, and they took him to that same place with my father. And so my father and Loveland, uh, you know, when you, were, uh, when you were captured, you were supposed to try to escape. And so they did, even though they were in great conditions. And they had the assistance of the Polish underground. And, and so they were taken down to a city in southern Hungary called Barsz. And uh, the plan was they were going to um, cross a river and end up in Yugoslavia and try to hook up with the partisans. And if this worked, then other... Uh, um, Allied men who had showed up in, in, in Budapest and Hungary would also then try to go the same route. Well, the, the, the guy who was supposed to take them across the river sold them out. They were recaptured. Um, and then they were taken to a castle in southern Hungary in, in, the, in the town of um, Siklos. Siklos. This is now um, of, of January of 1944. Um, March of 44, Hitler is tired of what's going on in Hungary. He occupies uh, uh, Hungary. I think March 19th was the date. The uh, Germans showed up at, at the castle where my father was, and by now some other American airmen had shown up there as well. And uh, they grabbed these Americans and some Brits, and they put them on a train. And my father thought they were going to, uh, to Germany, to you know, a prisoner of war camp. But when the train finally let them, let them off, they were in Yugoslavia. And, and they were taken to Belgrade and then let off the train. And they were taken across the river um, from Belgrade, um, a town called Simon. And on April 16th, the Americans bombed Belgrade, bombed the hell out of Belgrade. And um, as Jim was talking earlier, you know, the, there was not precision bombing. And some of the bombs meant to hit uh, Belgrade inadvertently landed on this prisoner of war camp where my father was. And uh, by now, this was a real, this was a bad um, uh, prisoner of war camp. It, you know, it was not like the sort of cushy conditions he'd been in Hungary. And some of the bombs inadvertently landed on the camp and, and the, on April 16, 1944, they killed, I think, 17 men. There was not only the, some allies people there, but there was also Serbs and Italians, and those are the people who died that day. The next day, um, the Americans returned to Belgrade, and they're, they're going after the marshalling yards in Belgrade, which is right across the river from where, where my father was. And then, on, and then on, on the back side of where my father was, was the, air, the airport. And they also bombed that day. So my dad's prisoner of war camp was right in the middle. And um, worst bombing that, that day, April 17th, 
um, just scene of destruction in, this, in Belgrade, but also this prisoner of war camp. About 500 men died, and the camp was just leveled. My, my father was in a, uh, um, the, 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 the soil is sandy there. It's right where the Danube and the Sava rivers meet. And uh, he, he, try, he and the other Americans, they, they sort of dug little trenches in the sand as the best they could to survive. And I, I've, I've got the bomb strike photographs um, from that day, and you, it's incredible. You can see the bombs coming out of the bottom of the planes, and you can see the, um, the outlines of the barracks below uh, where my father was, you know, trying to desperately stay alive from his own side. So a lot more men died, uh, prisoners of war died that day as well. And um, they herded the, the prisoners of war into kind of a small area. And uh, my dad and Lovell made a decision, well, we gotta get the hell out of here. You know, the Americans could come back here tomorrow and finish us off. They also f knew that where they were, it was a, a transfer camp in, in Yugoslavia and they were gonna be transferred very soon into you know, Germany. So, um, there was a Jewish man, a uh, Jewish prisoner of war, British, uh, named Lowenstein. And Lowenstein was this amazing guy who spoke like nine languages, and it was a master forger. And, and he had helped a bunch of guys escape uh, uh, from prisoners of war camp up in, you know, in Austria and Germany. And if you've ever read these accounts of the ingenuity of the prisoners of war, um, it's just unbelievable what they would do with a spoon or, or the top of a can or, so, or a pair of shoelaces or how they would create uh, like the bottom of a shoe and they, they, that would become the stamp to create that Lowenstein would use to, to create these incredibly beautiful fake documents that would fool even the German um, Nazis. Uh, the, 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 um. So um, Lowenstein that day did a diversion and my father and, Lowenst and Loveland, um, they went through a hole. One of the things that had also happened in the bombing was to put a hole in the fence that, that, that day. So that night, my father and Lowenst, they go through the hole. They ended up in a, in a, in a pit of sand because there was a bomb crater. You, you know, you, have you ever, when you were perhaps younger, tried to, to climb out of uh, like an, a sand embankment, how hard it is because the sand kind of pulls, it, pulls you back down? Well, they were starting to run through there, and they were starting to come up, and they couldn't get out, and they yelled, help. And two guys had just run through there before, one guy named McLean and another guy named Davies. And McLean and Davies had a split-second decision. You know, did they just run the hell out of there? But they hear these voices, so they came back, and they pulled my father and Loveland out of that, uh, out of that uh, bomb crater. And the four of them went off running, and uh, they, they weren't quite sure where they were going to go. Their goal was to hook up with the partisans, and uh, they were able to do that. Um, they met a shepherd. They were, all, they were almost killed a couple times by the Ustashi, the allies of the Germans. And, uh, but they met a shepherd who led them to a village. They didn't know what was going to happen, whether they were going to be killed or not. Um, my father had been told by the, the, what, what the, you know, the, the sign of the partisans uh, was a red star. And that if you met them, there was a certain phrase that you used. Um, I'm going to mispronounce it. It's smirch. Do you know what it is? Anyway, so my father said the phrase, and then the, 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 the partisans responded, and so then they were now protected. They were in an area west of Belgrade. Um, it's like 7 o'clock. Do I need to stop? Should I stop now? Should I stop now? Okay, okay I'll keep going. <laughs> so um, they're in an area west of Belgrade, if, if any of you have ever read the accounts of the partisans, they were, in, you know, they were in, in these incredibly hilly areas so often. But this was actually not a hilly area. And so it, it's, it was fascinating where the, the partisans had sort of the little villages. They, were, they could be there during the day. And then they, would, they had these bell towers and, at the churches. And they would uh, see off in the distance from the dirt streets, um, that dirt roads, that the... Uh, Germans were coming, and so when they saw that, they would all run into the woods, and that's just how the partisans kept my father and the other prisoners. There's another one showed up, so there's four other prisoners of war, and um, they would go into the woods during the day. They kept moving around, kind of one step ahead of the Germans. The Germans knew my father was out there somewhere. I, I've got a document from the Gestapo that they were looking for him because he was a pilot. It was a big deal. They ended up in, a, in an area called the Furushka Gora, which is a low-range mountain. 
um, west of Belgrade, and the Germans were, uh, had a, 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 um, an operation where they were going to capture the partisans and whoever else was in there. And the partisans always knew what the Germans were going to do. And my father and, and the others escaped from the, the Frushka Gora just before the Germans uh, enclosed the circle to, to capture them all. And by chance, my father, his little band, had met a, a Major Davidson who was with the British. Uh, he was a liaison with the partisans. And Major Davidson had um, a wireless radio. And so he was able to get word back to his base, Bari. Major Davidson was with the SOE, that these guys were out there. Um, and I've, I was able to get the, um, the transcripts of these, these transmissions back to Bari, back and forth. And so after my father's group left the Frushka Gora, they ended up in an area called the Woods of Bosut. And it was an area that the Germans couldn't quite get to. And my father oversaw the, he, one day he found a field and he, he thought this could be turned into a, a kind of a, a very rough airstrip. And there are certain rules that the British had about how to fix it all up and he was able to do that. And uh, there was wire cables going back and forth. And then, um, there was one problem because the Germans had a rail gun right nearby. But on the night of July 20th, 1944, um, the partisans carried out a diversion to disable that rail gun that could have um, bombed where they were. And a, a British Dakota uh, plane landed at, at midnight, uh, in you know, the middle of the night, this field that the uh, men lit up as soon as the plane landed. And uh, my father by then had malaria. A couple of the other guys had malaria. They were in terrible shape. Uh, but that Dakota plane picked them up and took them back to, to Bari, Italy. And, um, and my father's war ended. Thank you. Wow. OK, thank you all, not only for three the wonderful presentations, but also for three very different presentation styles. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, they're actually within time, uh, uh, the time allotted. Uh, and maybe we can go over, if you don't mind, Lauren, for a few minutes and uh, ask around, uh, have you ask around of questions, if you have any. Any, any questions or comments? Yeah. MIAs have they been identified these mass graves in uh, Vienna? Uh, <clears throat> the, the mass grave near, near, near the Graz area I mentioned. Um, no, not yet. Um, it's, it's an ongoing process as, as we found those mass graves only, only a few years ago. So it's, it's an ongoing process, uh, ongoing process at the moment. The from Connecticut um, executed or did he survive? Pardon, didn't the from Connecticut, did he survive? Yes, he survived, yeah. The gallows you mentioned, were they formal, you know, like in the Western movies where they had the drop door or did they just string them up on a tree? No, it was it was a lamp post, not 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 <coughs> not, not, not gallows. So sort of trees or lamp posts like like this. Any more questions? Yeah. I was interested uh, in your comments. Is your work supported by the German Defense Department? Is that who's underwriting this research? Um, but by the Austrian Defense Department. The Austrian Defense Department. Uh, no, in, 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 some, in some respect, yes, because um, regarding specific war crime cases, um, which happened inside barracks, for example, barracks which are still in use today by the Austrian army, that's the part where we're working on um, with the support of the Austrian Ministry of Defense. In this case, it's right, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> No more questions? 
Okay, if there is no more questions, then we thank you all very much for coming this evening. Thanks uh, to our panelists for wonderful presentations. And if anybody wants to buy Jim Weingartner's book, he will be uh, uh, signing it outside. And uh, thanks for coming. Have a good evening.